And at that time, the House Un-American Activities Committee already existed. And this is the part of the story they don't tell you about, right? They write Arthur Miller, who himself was probably a communist. Arthur Miller wrote the crucible about uh, the McCarthy hearings and the House Un-American Activities Committee hearings. The part he doesn't tell you is the House Un-American Activities Committee was founded to root out any domestic uh, sort of manifestation of a foreign body, you know, invading the U.S. So basically any domestic communist or fascist, it started out rooting out Nazis. The fifth column, the Bund, was why this group was formed. And they reluctantly began looking into communism. Yeah, man, I wanted to, uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about metal because I know nothing about it. But uh, when I when I see you talk about it and I hear certain songs, I'm like, oh, this is pretty awesome. But your your video on Hollywood always being red, I've, you know, I've I think I've watched it and rewatched it like a million times just today. And uh, I thought I thought it was so fascinating. So um, that's really what I want to focus on, because you're far more studied uh, in this topic than myself. So yeah. Um, it That's was crazy. Up. I, you know, how I got into that was, <laughs> uh, you may have noticed I'm uh, slightly pale. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, I get a suntan from opening a refrigerator wow. and, uh, I wanted to get a slightly better, I, I wanted to not be the color of undercooked bacon. And mm -hmm. so I was, I needed an excuse to sit outside for a while. This is literally how this happened. And <laughs> this is ridiculous to admit, but I needed an excuse to sit outside for a while because normally in Arizona, you tend to flee from the sun. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so I, I had this book. I went over to like a swap meet and picked up this book and it looked interesting. And it was by this guy who was um, worked in some capacity as a state of California, like historical preservationists. Mm -hmm. Like he was working for the government for a while. And I guess in the course of his studies, he found some rather interesting little factoids. It's uh, Kenneth Lloyd Billingsley, his book, Hollywood Party. Okay. And I read this thing cover to cover and every new chapter just blew my mind. Um, the guy's great. Uh, he, he writes it really interestingly. You can tell he's kind of a first time writer. It's a little clunky in the way that he writes it. Uh, like I'm one to talk. But he, I mean, it's painstakingly sourced. He's got the, right down to the original propaganda flyers that alleged that Disney was an anti-Semite, which is still an allegation that sticks to this day. And it's a complete falsehood. It's not true at all. He was not anti-Semitic. In fact, most of his head animators were Jewish. And, and mm -hmm. he had one uh, black animator in there. And he was like not a racist guy at all. But the smear that Walt Disney was a racist only began to happen when he caught wind of issues with union politics within his own animators union. Because hmm. there was this group called the, the, the they love their acronyms, communists, uh, the, <laughs> the <laughs> Conference of Studio Unions, the CSU, under the, uh, under the tutelage of Herb Sorrell, who was, you know, he was one of those communists who was like an off the books card carrying member. They didn't, mm. they had certain members that they, they wouldn't be card carrying members. They wouldn't necessarily be paying their little fees, but they were, they were allegiant in every other way because they didn't want any direct contact to the communist party USA. Right. Mm. So Herb Sorrell was one of those. He was quoted one time as saying, you know, Oh, I'm not a card carrying communist, but I am happy to take lots of their money. And I do, you know what I mean? Like he was, mm. he was wink, wink, nudge, nudge, a card carrying communist. And he was running this conference of studio unions and he was trying to consolidate all like he went after a carpenter's union and they rolled over. He went after a script readers union and they rolled over, which is really one of the big stories in mm. 30s and 40s Hollywood was one, it wasn't so much the messages they were inserting into pictures. It was the messages that weren't allowed to be in, in pictures because right. they got a hold of the script readers who were the ones who recommended scripts to go higher up to the actual directors. And they were knocking down anything that was negative toward Stalin, negative toward, you know, even Lenin going further than that. And so like, 
that, that was really what happened. So the CSU was trying to take over his animators union. They got to them and some of the animators were like, wait a minute, this is a bad deal for us. We already have our union. We're happy with it. And they were doing things, which is still, this goes on in union meetings today. They were using these sketchy tactics. They would um, they would manipulate crowd psychology. They'd have a, they'd call a union meeting, for example, and there were only so many actual communists. There's like they'd have four or five actual communists, and then everybody else is either a liberal union guy or maybe a right wing union guy, just union people, just regular mm -hmm. hard work and union people, and they'd be filling out the crowd, and the five communists would sort of uh, they'd filter into the room at different intervals all over the place. And when somebody they didn't like was speaking, they would from different corners of the room begin shouting epithets at them, begin whatever, and it would create the illusion that there was a unanimity to it. And that would sort of spark the crowd psychology and get wow. the whole room turned against them, or at least it would sound like the whole room had turned against them. And so the people they didn't want wouldn't be in charge of the union and the people they did want would be in charge of the union. And this was what they were trying to do to the cartoonist union. So Walt Disney finds out about this and he hates getting involved in union politics. He didn't want to. You can watch his full testimony in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee hearings, by the way. He makes that pretty clear. He didn't want to get involved, mm -hmm. but he finally got involved because his animators were literally begging him. And from that moment on, Walt Disney, the anti-Semite, like that's how it goes. And it just it's a fascinating glimpse into a period of Hollywood. And unfortunately, the artifacts of that are still very much present. In fact, I would imagine in the last several years are probably emboldened. The Hollywood party as it exists, the one that the, the sort of titular Hollywood party um, ceased to exist after the Cold War, really. But you, you get these glimpses. I showed, I forget if I showed it in that video or in a later one, when they gave, you, you might remember this, in 1999, Elia Kazan, famous director mm -hmm. uh, on the waterfront and a bunch of incredible movies. He had been refused a Lifetime Achievement Oscar for mm -hmm. a long time because he spoke out against the Hollywood Communist Party. He named names and so forth. And finally, in 1997 or 99, somewhere in there, late 90s, he gets his Lifetime Achievement Oscar, and it was still controversial. It's in the 90s, guys. The Cold War's over. The Soviet Union has fallen, and there are people outside protesting. So the idea that there are not communists in Hollywood is a falsehood. It is not true. In fact, Sir Patrick Stewart, who I like Sir Patrick Stewart. He's one of my favorite Star Trek captains. He's outside saying, you know, I... I it, they literally interviewed him on the red carpet. I'm yeah. not sure I agree with giving him a lifetime achievement Oscar and so forth. Like, you know, some people <laughs> you would be surprised. Quentin Tarantino, I believe, refused to stand and clap when he was given his Oscar. Some faces, some very interesting faces uh, did not stand and clap. I think Spielberg even might have refused mm. to. It was it was interesting. So. Well, you know, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that that font of information and historical um <laughs> Uh, uh, narrative uh, comes from today's guest. Uh, as yeah, as you usual. haven't even introduced me. I'm sorry. You just yank the rant pull switch, and I just go off. I know it's it's so it's so great. It's also uh, you know because normally I do I, I kind of I kind of do an intro and and everything, but it's nice to have, do do be a little unconventional. And also, I mean, just what you're talking about to me is so is so fascinating. So we're going to jump right back into all of that um, because yeah. it, it, it speaks to a huge blind spot, which I've experienced uh, in the industry um, myself uh, in terms of communism, uh, Marxism. I think a lot of people, they, they don't even understand what, what this stuff is, but please introduce yourself for, for, the, for the fine people that are watching uh, wherever they're watching this. Yes, I am a uh, razor fist. I am a uh... Ranter, a comedian, a ballerina. I am one of five able-bodied American males on the North American landmass who has never hosted the Family Feud. I uh, <laughs> I am here. I am here. I'm I'm glad to be here as well. I do a, a program called the Rage Holic. I'm now a writer. I will not call myself an author. 
Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm two books in somehow. I'm about to drop the new book, which is actually available for pre-order right now. It's called Death Mask. It's a fantasy noir deal. We'll probably talk about that later. But um, yeah, I do. I do writing. I m most of my byline is doing sort of ranty videos, sometimes video essays. I do uh, a series on film noir uh, that is more video essay ish. Not a whole lot of dick jokes in that, but I'll find a way. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I do a lot of things. I do a lot of things. Well, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Fist uh, is uh, maybe underselling himself a little bit. He's one of these people who uh, he has such a way uh, with language and uh, regular viewers of mine understand that I, I am a big fan of, of language and the power of language and the way that people use it. And you're one of those people who I, I'm like, how do you not have like a billion subscribers? Your, your way with words, your ability to uh, combine humor and eloquence and um, uh, is you know it's 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 really really impressive and astounding and um it, it's i i, I can't I, complain really... i mean i'm I, look I'm, I'm doing better than i deserve to for a guy who you know will reference medieval poetry in the middle of a vagina joke you know well, i'm doing way better than i have any right to i am thriving like a dosa clap at a biker rally compared to what i should be frankly well, see, to, not, not, not to me. I mean, you say that, but then I think about uh, comedians like Dennis Miller, who just references all kinds of off the wall genius, shit that yeah. nobody knows about. And I love to, even as, even as a kid, honestly, I love, I, I love Dennis Miller. I don't, I have yeah, no idea why. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like 10 years old watching Dennis Miller. <laughs> like, it is, it, Dennis Miller live is replacing Dennis Miller live with Bill Maher, who I don't hate Bill Maher, but replacing right. Dennis Miller live with Bill Maher. Talk about a downgrade. Just in terms of comedic talent, not in terms of politics or whatever. I obviously do not agree with Bill Maher, but I don't hate him comedically. It's just not as good as Dennis Miller. Come on. Like Dennis Miller Live was some shit. I'm just it was, saying. It was pretty awesome. I even liked him on, on Weekend Update as well when he hosted that yes. uh, back in the day. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, however you're consuming this content, as always, remember uh, to like and share and subscribe. If you love it, please share it with your friends. And if you hate it, please share it with your enemies. Um, we are here to talk about um, a very, very prescient uh, subject uh, today. Um, I, I initially contacted uh, Mr. Fist, the good Mr. Fist, um, about uh, maybe talking about metal and maybe touching on um, uh, he, has, he has some really great videos about the history of communism in Hollywood specifically. And um, I, I, but I found his work, there's a video he made called Hollywood Was Always Red, uh, which I'll link in the description. You all must go watch it. It's about half an hour long. And as all of, um, as is all of his, his uh, content is just enormously entertaining, but also very informative. And as someone who uh, has been an actor um, and, and seen many, many, and been many, many places uh, as such. I just said, you know, this, cause I, I got, okay. So let me just say, give you a little, a little background on me. So <clears throat> back in like 2012, I did this play called the Scottsboro Boys um, out, out in California. And in my preparation uh, for, uh, for the play, I, I stumbled in my research upon um, this fact that the, uh, the lawyer that was appointed uh, in the case. And for those who don't know, uh, the Scottsboro Boys is a musical that was uh, written by the creators of uh, Cabaret in Chicago. And uh, it took this this uh, satir uh, excuse me satirical look um, at this um, event in the nineteen in nineteen thirty three where these nine black boys ranging in age from uh, eighteen and as young as twelve they were falsely accused of uh, violating the honor shall we say of two white women who later recant one of them uh, one of whom later recanted her story because it just wasn't true and um, in and it. it, it some see that event as a catalyst. It got it got worldwide attention. Um, some see it as a catalyst for the civil rights uh, movement uh, in the ensuing decades. In fact, I think Rosa Parks was involved in activism for the boys and actually met her husband at a rally. But um, I, I learned in the course of my research that um, the lawyer that was appointed um, to defend the Scottsboro boys um, was sent by, I can't remember the name of it, but it was an affiliate of the Communist Party of America. And that's when I first learned about the communist interest in the civil rights movement, for one. But just the word communist in general, I see it had, it had, this is 2012, it had no bearing on me. I just, it didn't make any, you know, I didn't know anything about it. I'd never really heard of it before. I just, you know, it, it went in one ear and out the other, essentially. And, um, you know, now looking back on it, I, I, it, it, strikes me as indicative of the huge, huge blind spot um, about this particular ideology 
um, that exists in the entertainment industry at large. And so um, when I watched your video, um, Hollywood was always red. You introduced me a to the, the essay by Albert Maltz, which I which I reference all the time now. Uh, what shall we ask of writers? And, and, and the punishment he suffered as a result of that is just an unbelievable too. We'll probably talk about that. But well, of course he got because he because everything he wrote seventy five years ago. Um, you know, so I mean, we talk about wokeness in Hollywood, and by the way, in the American theater, it's even the, the dosages are even ten times are ten times more concentrated uh, in terms of wokeness and quote unquote progressivism. But uh, you know, he if people go back and read this essay, I mean, everything that he talks about, we are seeing today that the limitations on thought, the crippling of or, or the, the debilitating effect it has on a writer's craft, how it affects critics. Um, it's just everything he, he talked about. So, of course, I'm not surprised he was just completely, completely mauled uh, afterward and, and forced to kind of uh, uh, do a mea culpa <clears throat> afterwards. And um, but, he, uh, he literally went on one of the ear earliest apology tours. They had him hmm. at, at Hollywood functions, not even like communist functions, not even we're talking cocktail parties. He'd be, you know. Catherine Hepburn, who, by the way, some of her speeches were written by a communist and uh, mm. and other people who were just kind of fellow travelers and then just regular old liberals would be milling about having their cocktails. And here's Albert Maltz getting up on a podium, just prostrating himself before okay. all these people embarrassing himself. And he did that for like a year. He just he went to every single Hollywood function and embarrassed himself solely for the, the crime of speaking out against the logical end game of the philosophy, which he adhered to it, Very, very sad uh, for such a talented writer too. Albert mm. Maltz wrote a lot of great films, but very, very sad. Well, let's go, let's go back um, a little bit. Uh, you started talking about um, Walt Disney and being him being smeared as an anti-Semite, which is, which is funny to me because it, it, to me, it harkens back to this idea that if you disagree with me, you're a Nazi, you're alt-right. You're far right, yada yada yada. So they they always resort to this character assassination, and um, it, it's funny to me because I, I'm someone who looks who does look at someone like Paul Robeson as a as a trailblazer and and a uh, yeah. and and a hero. And it's funny because now I, I I do that with a caveat of, yeah, but he was also a dirty commie <laughs> who, and, who was and like it's... learning Russian to go to go live in Russia. I know well, Paul <laughs> Robeson is such a talented pioneer in the history of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, I know Avery Brooks, who I'm a big fan of, an actor, is also a huge Paul Robeson. He did a one man show about Paul Robeson, and yeah. it's unbelievable, like what he matter he means to Hollywood in the early days. As did a, I think James Earl Jones did the same show as well. Yeah, and um, he, I mean, it was so bad with Paul Robeson. He literally, it was. Not only did he engage in apologia here on the American continent, right? He knew enough because he was early enough into the sort of cohabitation between the early civil rights movement and communism that he was invited to go over to Russia a number of times. Right. And so he got there early on. And then, of course, the Stalin purges began to happen. And he winds up in Russia, in the heart of the Stalin purges. He's literally in today, St. Petersburg. And uh, he's he's meeting with, um, there's a, a band leader, I believe, uh, or no, 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 a composer in Russia who had spoken out against the Stalin purges. And it's a good friend of Paul Robeson who had been there by this point a number of times. And keep in mind, this is now at a time where in the West, we're, all, we're beginning to hear about the Stalin crimes. We're starting to hear about it, but still we're sort of ambivalent, not sure if we all want to believe it. So Paul Robeson goes there and this composer is missing. And musicians who had worked with him, who were also acquainted with Paul Robeson, warn him, like, you don't understand what's going on here. You need to leave. Your life could be in danger because they could literally come after you just for finding this out. Mm -hmm. So you need to like go. <laughs> And so Paul Robeson takes off and uh, when so he comes back, he winds up. Well, what matters really is at the end of the day, the composer turns up in the middle of Red Square assassinated. Um, he's he was apparently purged by Stalin. 
Um, God knows what happened to the, to the musicians who warned Paul Robeson. But meanwhile, as this is happening, almost simultaneously, Paul Robeson is speaking at dinners, talking about how like he's embarrassed to be American and style, like what did he, his exact quote, oh my God, at this dinner is, being in Russia just this last time is the last time is the first time in my life I felt truly free. <laughs> and this is after he finds out about what's likely happened to his composer friend. Um, you just, that's a kind of dedicated to the ideology that goes beyond just, and maybe it's because again, communism latched on to the American civil rights movement very, very early. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. It, it's, to the it, point where they were proposing a Southern taking the Southern United States from landed whites and giving it to blacks completely. They were going to call it this. I forget what the full name. It was like going to be the, the Southern Soviet republics. And of course, Russia, were going to be in charge, but, <laughs> but they were going to give it in air quotes to uh, African-Americans. And that was, so this, these kind of ideas were used to sort of draw early adherence to the civil rights movement in. And I suspect that's probably why Paul Robeson was so dedicated to it, to the point where he was willing to overlook likely murders. Granted, he didn't have any visual confirmation yet, but still to go to a dinner <laughs> and go to a cocktail party and literally stand up and speak and say, God, I, I can't believe how free I felt over there. It's a nice, crisp, clean air while you're breathing the farts of communism, literally from, from Stalin's purges wafting over the Atlantic. Well, it's, uh, you know, it just goes back to this, um, this linkage uh, between uh, the Communist Party and civil rights, you know, in, in the book, uh, The God That Failed, which you also recommended, I mean, I read, I read Richard Wright's um, entry in there, for those who don't know, Richard Wright, um, black author, uh, most known for his book, The Native Son, um, <clears throat> or just Native Son, I should say. And, um, you know, it just it, there is a I think it's a, a, I think it's very cynical. There's also a great book. I don't know if you've heard of this called um, um, <clears throat> "Was a Color and Common Co Color Communism and Common Sense" by a guy named Manning Johnson, who was a who was a black man who was a uh, a very dedicated and devoted communist. And he was in the party. He was taking uh, uh, he was taking meetings with uh, with top uh, 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 people in the Kremlin and yada yada yada. But then he got out of the ide ideology once he once he understood that they actually don't give a fuck about black people. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so he has this, and you can, and this is sort of, sort of beside the point, but you can go find um, uh, a, a speech of his that he gave uh, maybe like weeks before he died uh, in, in a car accident. And um, he, and all the things that he has to say about organizations like the NAACP or about these activist organizations uh, that, that, that ostensibly uh, operate on behalf of black people. Um, it's right. so, it, it, you know, it's like it, he could have said it yesterday. And yep. um, it's, it's so I actually have I have a recommendation in, in corollary to that. I'm sorry. I was okay. I was I was trying to think in the back of my mind while I was talking about the, the Soviet uh, Southern Republics or whatever that they were proposing where African-Americans would take over the Southern United States. It was uh, there's a book, a propaganda pamphlet, essentially. And I believe it is available in full PDF online um, by James W. Ford and James S. Allen. I'm pretty sure just ghostwriters for the Communist Party USA. It's called The Negroes in a Soviet America. And it lays out this proposal completely from top to bottom. It, it's wild. It's wild. It's crazy because you'll play like a Fallout video game or something, or you'll see a modern interpretation of like a Stepford Wives kind of 50s Cold War America. And you think, oh, those tuck and roll drills were so, you know, hyperbolic and they, it was so quaint. You know what I mean? And then you read this and you realize the Soviets had the exact same kind of propaganda. We just never hear about it because the people making all this entertainment are somewhat sympathetic with it still to this day. So that's really, yeah, but yeah, it, it's a wild read folks. Definitely check that out. Uh, I just wrote that down. So, but that, let's not stray too far from the, the matter yeah. at hand. So let's go back to um, um, uh, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy. Now yeah. this is somebody now as an actor, uh, all you hear about Joe McCarthy is that he was this uh, sort of crazy, paranoid, right-wing maniac who uh, was so heated about communism uh, that uh, you know he he led to it was him that caused uh, you know whatever the Hollywood Ten or whatever it's called uh, to be blacklisted from the industry. But that's not exactly true, is it? No, it's not. Um, and and the clue is in the name. The so the organization that was convened to root out Hollywood communists after the initial whistleblower Roy Brewer heard about it. 
right? He was he was getting reports. Basically, you have to get into how this started, which is in a Hollywood context anyways. There was a union boss. I believe he was based out of, I want to say, Missouri, Roy Brewer. And he was sort of overseeing a bunch of other unions, just a lifelong union man, lifelong Democrat. And he kept getting reports about it. And he thought they were, you know, really? Russian communists are coming after our unions? Come on. Like, so he's like, fine, I'll humor him. I'll go out to California, whatever. I'll go check it out. And he got there and found out, oh my God, the problem is a thousand times worse than I was told. This is not only not cartoonish or hyperbolic. This is something that is actually happening. This is bad. And at that point, he started taking testimony, actually gathering evidence. I mean, he's really the initial whistleblower and, um, you know, a lifelong union Democrat guy. So he gets into it. And at that time, the House on American Activities Committee already existed. And this is the part of the story they don't tell you about, right? They write Arthur Miller, who himself was probably a communist. Arthur Miller wrote the crucible about uh, the McCarthy hearings and the House on American Activities Committee hearings. The part he doesn't tell you is the House on American Activities Committee was founded to root out any domestic uh, sort of manifestation of a foreign body, you know, invading the U.S. So basically any domestic communist or fascist, it started out rooting out Nazis, the fifth column, the Bund was why this group was formed. And they reluctantly began looking into communism because at the time they didn't have anywhere near as much uh, incentive to look into that. But this is the red decade. It's the 30s into the early 40s. And so, okay, maybe we should start looking into this. Roy Brewer winds up being really the key uh, linchpin in all of that. So the House and American Activities Committee, the, in other words, the hearings that lead to the blacklisted Hollywood tent, which again, is not imposed by the government. The clue that McCarthy had nothing to do with that is in the name, House on American Activities Committee. Joe McCarthy was a senator. He could not participate in House hearings. What happened with Joe McCarthy is that some of the other intelligence that was gathered during the House on American Activities Committee hearings, which are in the mid 40s, mind you, all, some of that information is put by the wayside. In, in World War II, FDR, it's, it's no exaggeration to say, actually, there's a number of really good books you can read, Blacklisted by History, um, a, a Witness, some other ones. And, and these make clear that like FDR was essentially covering up domestic infiltration by communist agents, um, mm. especially in the overseas services and some of the new government programs that the New Deal had rolled out. And so basically, there was an incentive to bury this. So this information went by the wayside. Really what happens is Joseph McCarthy gets a hold of that information in the early 50s and goes, what are we going to do anything with this? Like, so it's like five years later, these people are probably more entrenched. We not only need to look back into this, we probably need to expand that into government. We need to concentrate on whether or not there are agents in government, because by that point, it became clear that China may have been handed over to the Soviets under the advice of Soviet agents on both sides, mind you, people embedded in China, people embedded uh, here in the United States. It certainly happened in Japan. One of, prior to World War II, one of the crazy things you learn is there were Soviet agents working on both sides in America and in Japan to undermine prospective peace, which puts the US and Japan on a war foot, footing and had a big part to play in why Japan continued to pursue the tactics that led to them feeling that they needed to preemptively attack the United States and so forth. So this is like really McCarthy is stumbling on this, right? So he comes later. He has nothing really to do with Hollywood. There, there are a few actors and so forth, people in Hollywood who are called into his hearings. But no, the Hollywood hearings, the communist hearings that lead to the blacklisted Hollywood 10 have nothing to do with McCarthy. And it's just become this big conflated thing. McCarthy wasn't even elected when the House Un-American Activities Committee was still talking about communism. Let's put it that way. He wasn't even in his office at that point. He gets elected later. Well, it's interesting because, you know, it, it's um, <clears throat> everything you hear about the HUAC um, yeah. is just about how how evil it was. And of course, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's fascinating the kinds of names that come up when you start to look into this stuff, including Walt Disney. Um, I mean, yeah. John Wayne, um, yep. You know, there it, was a counter group, um, a right. counter, like an anti-Hollywood communist group that formed. 
and Ronald Reagan, who's a Democrat at the time and quite a liberal one. Right. But in fact, this is really what red pills Ronald Reagan for all intents and purposes. This is mm. where he begins his slow turn towards conservatism is Ronald Reagan thought that these people, you know, oh, this is just normal union politics. And then he heads into those meetings and the meetings that I describe where they're using crowd psychology and what he's witnessing these things. And he's saying, oh, wait a minute. This is not just, this isn't liberalism. This is not liberal. This is not what I signed on for. And so Ronald Reagan becomes a whistleblower. John Wayne becomes very active. Gary Cooper becomes very active. Oh, wow. And here's the other part that you don't hear is the people who start blacklisting Hollywood actors are communists. It's the studio. It's only when the studio bosses who back then were largely Republican begin blacklisting actors and they, they blacklist them for very simple PR reasons because the public are not attending movies with actors who they learn are communists. Probably the most prominent example of this is the movie, one of my favorite film noir, very underrated, called Dark Passage with uh, Bogey and Bacall. Mm. And it's a big, you know, huge uh, Hollywood film noir at the time. Well, the House on American Activities Committee, by this point, it's 1946, they are raging. And so a couple of communist lawyers, and by communist lawyers, I mean lawyers directly enthralled to the Communist Party USA, get together a group, Citizens for uh, the First Amendment, I believe it's called, Citizens for Free Speech, whatever. Mm. And what they're doing is they're basically engaging Hollywood types, regular liberals, and they are hoodwinking. Some of them are communists, but other, most of them are just their approach for their cachet, right? So who's bigger in Hollywood at that time than Humphrey Bogart? So they approach Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, who's even more left, left leaning and was her entire life. May she rest in peace. She passed away a few years ago. Um, they, they approach both of them and she probably persuades him to go. And basically they're going to sit in on the House on american Activities Committee. And under this sort of veneer that we're standing for free speech, these people are being persecuted for their domestic political beliefs. And you still hear this to this day, right? The entire point of the crucible and the only way the crucible works is if these people are just being persecuted for something they're not guilty of, being foreign agents, being whatever. Star Trek The Next Generation later on does an episode called The Drumhead. That's like this. Oh, they're falsely accusing people. Of course, the problem is once Bogey and Bacall and all of these people are flown down, they sit down. And one of the senator, uh, one of the representatives uh, who's convening the meeting, he's like, "Okay, you want to come down? Fine. Let's talk about your lawyers. Let's talk about the people who organized mm. your group." And he decides that'll be the day when he hears the testimony about these two lawyers who organized the Citizens for the First Amendment. And Bogey and Bacall sit down thinking they're supporting free speech. And by the end, they're filthy, stinking Reds who supported a communist operation. And Bogey literally has to write an editorial in, uh, I forget if it was the New York Times or one of the big, like, screenplay or one of the big magazines of the time saying, I'm not a Red. You can read this article online, by the way. Humphrey wow. Bogart, I'm no Red. And uh, saying, he, he, I'm sorry, I was fooled. These people decided that, and, and he literally has to make that declaration because Dark Passage is released at this time, the movie, and nobody's going to see it. This is why the blacklist existed. It had nothing mm. to do with, we're going to censor these people. The government had nothing to do with it. The studio bosses blacklisted these people because if they were in their films, nobody would go see them. So this is why Humphrey Bogart, his sort of declaration that he's not a communist is evidence of this. But it's a reply to the communists who were already blacklisting actors like Ronald Reagan, like um, I, I remember um, Double Indemnity, like uh, Barbara Stanwyck was uh, boycotted and a, a bunch of people, Gary Cooper and so forth. That was the first Hollywood blacklist. And you can actually see if you if you read this book, there's actually scans of, of the flyers where they're listing off the actors. Oh, these people are blacklisted. Do not cross. These people cross the picket line. These are scabs, right? You can't go see their movies. Boycott them. And none of those boycotts really amounted to much because the communists in Hollywood at that time were pretty marginal. Really, it's kind of like what they're doing with Antifa today. It's kind of like what it's kind of like what Antifa are doing at BLM rallies today. BLM has the movement, right? The, the big 
the masses are with are with BLM, or at least they were. I think they've lost some cachet in, in recent years. But Antifa insert themselves. They're much smaller numbers, but much more active and more violent. They insert themselves into it in order to provoke. They're, this has constantly been a trend of communism using that sort of crowd psychology. That's, that's fascinating. It, it, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about um, it actually... You know, I, my contention for a long time has been that, uh, you know, even if people don't have Ivy League degrees or, you know, especially high IQs, I mean, you don't need to have uh, uh, some sort of, you know, great education to, to know what you like and what you don't like. And I, I love to hear these stories of audiences, American audiences deciding, you know, we're not going to participate in these illiberal anti-freedom um, um, exercises, whether you like it or not, it's uh, it's yeah. it's really heartening to hear. I, th I feel like there, there's still a strain of that um, today, where people are, you know, if people find out about these kinds of things, they're, they're saying no, we don't want this. So I wonder if it, it fuels part of the revulsion that people have towards what we what we now call quote unquote woke um, entertainment. Where people are, yeah. there's something underneath that where people are just sort of intuitively rejecting all of these things, and uh, you know, just I, I always say, you know, the uh, one of my sort of, I, I kind of, I kind of got red pilled in an innocent way. A, uh, you know, from the story earlier, I told you about the Scottsboro Boys, but also, you know, just reading old plays, and um, what you realize is that, um, you know, and doing research around them, is so what you realize is that, you know, even though civilizations change, customs change, mores change, we have all this new technology now. But what motivates people has largely remained unchanged for thousands and thousands and thousands of years of human history. And so it's just nice to see those connections from the past and, um, and for people saying like, no, we're Americans, we're gonna reject this. We, we, favor, um, we favor more freedom uh, than, than not, as opposed to this creeping ideology, which, uh, which we see as murderous and, uh, and cruel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I should add the, um, the, the initial communist blacklist was in connection with the thing we haven't even talked about, which is the big Black Friday riot. I mean, if you think these riots are anything new, you're out of your mind. They needed 15 separate ambulances to carry the, the victims of this <laughs> of this violence away. Right. Was it that was a, a, big, a Sorrel uh, thing? Yes, uh, Herb Sorrell and, and the CSU organized this massive strike, basically a work stoppage. And there was a group of actors. It was a larger group than you would think, but it was big names, some of them. Like I said, Barbara Stanwyck, Lana Turner was involved mm. in that group. And um, groups of actors who were like, okay, look, if if July 1st rolls around and this strike is still going, uh, give me a ring because fuck these picketers, right? And that was the first Hollywood blacklist. And it was, again, in connection with communist violence that people were try to get into the studio they literally blockaded the studio lot people couldn't get there and so when they showed up they'd start beating on their cars and whatever and eventually riot cops showed up and it was a it was a big thing this is nothing new this what we're witnessing here is nothing new at all and um, more people should hear about the black friday that doesn't involve you know cheap plastic bricks at target so well, you know, which which now get um, which now yeah, get the stolen legitimate and bricks that get thrown through your car window. Those I was going to say <laughs> they, they, they get they get looted nowadays during uh, right exactly <laughs> during these riots. You know, uh, there's a hands uh, up, don't loot. Oh lord, uh, there's a. It, it makes me think about. Um, uh, what's his, uh, so Eric, Eric Weinstein, the progressive uh, economist talk, he has these two concepts that he coined uh, called the disc and the gin, the distributive um, idea suppression complex and the gated institutional narrative. And you see th both of those at play. I think that with the latter, um, you know, that, that's when you see uh, outlets like Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, so on, the New York Times, so on and so forth, where they, they're talking to each other, but they're excluding the, the actual audience of what they think, which is why you see, you know, a movie like Top Gun, Maverick, just completely blow everything away, but then they'll, they'll throw all their weight behind some, you know, some, maybe a light year or something, and, and it just completely tanks. But uh, I think about the, uh, the disc, the, and I, I see it happening all the time. You mentioned before, um, you know, who, like, who was allowing, who was green lighting these sorts of projects. And, you know, I think about one of, I mean, one of my favorite films of all time is, uh, is It's a Wonderful Life. And I was very, very, I was stunned 
to find out that Frank Capra, who uh, who uh, who directed it, was uh, apparently a conservative Republican. And uh, you know, I, I think to myself, you know, I I was so moved by that film, and uh, you know, I'm like 22 years old. I'm, I'm literally ugly crying, but I'm also an actor, so I go look at myself in the mirror, ugly crying. Like, is this what I look like when I do it? Okay, let me let me like let me remember this feeling. But <laughs> I said, how many how many experiences? How many how many people? How many audience members are we robbing of a potential? experience like that, like an It's a Wonderful Life, because there's so many people. I mean, I've, I've spoken to writers who said, I remember specifically um, at, in the wake of the, um, the Mizzou uh, University like uprising or whatever, where, you know, the other guy who went on a hunger strike, but like you're, his dad's fucking rich. <laughs> and it's just right. like, like, just let him starve. Um, and uh, he, um, he, he said, you know, he wrote a play based on these events, but what, but the mistake that he made was that he actually uh, made the story multidimensional. So, you know, he's giving, um, so, this, you know, this black uh, athlete or whatever has his own point of view, but also like the white, you know, older, uh, you know, coach or whatever has his point of view. And he gave them both um, uh, fair, you know, fair hearing in, in this play. And he was told by multiple theaters, like, yeah, let's, let's emphasize this black player more. Let's emphasize what this person has to say more. Can you, can you kind of, I don't know. I feel like this white character, he's a little bit too sympathetic. Can you, um, yep. you know, can you maybe, maybe soften him up a little bit? And um, I don't, I'm, you know, people don't really, I don't know if people really understand uh, the sort of mechanisms at play that keep stories from, from, from getting to us. And I think now. Oh, it's... absolutely. Gosh, I was just oh, yeah. listening to a uh, Norm MacDonald uh, interview the other day where he was talking about Seinfeld and how, why Seinfeld is so good. Right. And he's like, it's because they both were willing to walk. Jerry Seinfeld didn't care enough. Right. Because he he was probably in line to get the Tonight Show job. So he didn't give a shit. Oh, wow. And or he was on the short list anyway. And <laughs> Larry David didn't give a shit because he's just crazy. So he was just he was going to walk away <laughs> if they gave him too many notes. So Norm was literally telling a story of like it, it literally would some some network guy would walk in and be like, you know, what if what if Elaine didn't say this at this time? What if, what if she didn't like what what if we got got them together and whatever? And Larry would be sitting there putting, you know, he'd be, he'd be putting uh, practicing his uh, golf game and Jerry would be there with a bowl of cereal on a couch. And, and, and Jerry would go, you know, I, I don't think so. I think it's working the way it is. And what do you think, Larry? And Larry would be like, no, no, no. I think it's, it's fine. And, and if you force us to do it, I'll walk off. Mm. And the network guy was just like, oh, okay, that's fine. Whatever. <laughs> so, so consequently, even if you don't like Seinfeld, you have to agree that it was an undiluted uh, comedic vision that they had. It was, it was definitely the show that you saw on the TV was not watered down by network notes. It was the thing that they wanted to make at that particular time. That does in not happen anymore no. in anything. Uh, it's all studio notes. It's all focus groups. It's sad to say it's happening in video games as well, which was previously a fairly unencumbered medium, but now it's, it's getting just as bad as Hollywood and, uh, and certainly television production as well. Yeah, I, I just. Um, but of course, I, the checklists. Oh, we got to have. I mean, God, you watch an HBO drama, and you can literally see. Okay, we got to have X number of Latinos. We got to have X number of lesbian relationships. We got to have the X number of this subplot and so forth. And they will literally go down the checklist and change all of those things. And it's sad because HBO at one time was the network where you went with your completely unfiltered idea mm -hmm. to see it rendered on the screen without being fucked with. And now it's literally, it's checklist junction is what it is. And all network TV is that way. It's pathetic. Well, it also, I mean, it just completely, as a, as a minority actor, you know, I mean, I'm someone with 20 years of experience and elite level training, and it's just, I would... I would continually, I mean, even in New York City, I've told the story before, but, um, you know, over the years, I began to feel very sort of isolated from a lot of, um, from a lot of the culture, because I just felt like these people were making shows not for the audience, but for themselves, and for their peers to appease their peers and their colleagues, and you would, you know, and there were just so many times I would get a script, and it would be for really, a really, like, life-changing job, life-changing role, and you would read this script and, you know, it might be going well, but then you, you turn to the last page of the audition uh, material and it would be like, you know, racism, this and, and black people that and white people, this and white supremacy. And I'm just like, I don't, I, 
I got into this. I never got into this to be a, an activist. I just wanted to be a, an actor and I was very successful at it. And no one ever, and I, I never looked for any sort of special praise for being for being a black person and doing the things that I was doing, but right. it just became so ubiquitous and pervasive. This idea that, um, you know, I mean, I, I really, I really fear, and, and and I've had this echoed back to me multiple times now, is that because of the kinds of forces that you're that we're both talking about, people are going to now reflexively um, uh, push back or reject um, actors who who aren't white or who aren't male because they're going or who aren't straight because they're going to be looking at them and being like, well, they're not there because of their appeal or their craftsmanship or whatever. They're, they're it's just getting to that to point, man. It's awful because we've seen so many. I mean, we, we could list names, but we'd just be attacking people. But you know what I mean? We have definitely seen people in roles they should not have been in oh, yeah. because they had the <laughs> correct skin tone. It has it has absolutely happened. And I'm sure it happened back in the day when there was much more institutional racism toward, you know what I mean? Like much more ingrained societal racism with white people, right? In the early days of Hollywood, I'm sure. Well, for crying out loud, they still had blackface in the early days. So clearly they cast some white people in black roles. It did happen. Well, <laughs> but here's the thing though, because- on their face. Well, but, yeah. but, but but then, you know, back then, you know, you, you had people yeah. that still broke through like like a Paul Robeson, like a James Earl Jones, Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, Sammy Davis yep. Jr. Um, and Ethel they had Waters. to be they had to be twice. They had to be able to do everything. Well, they, well, they that, well, that's the they point. couldn't leave any like they couldn't drop drop a stitch. So Sammy Davis Jr. had to be a great dancer and singer and actor. And, you know, he had to do it all. You know what I mean? Well, and there's a the thing now, because I, th I feel like we've swung in the opposite direction now where you had yep. to be absolutely stunning in order to break through initially. But now, you know, you just have to kind of exist. And um, people are kind of just being being given uh, given roles for stuff that they, yeah. you know, that it's just like. You know, I mean, I've been I'll tell you what the rawest distillation of it is. You, you want to hear what it is? Go for Wikipedia. it. Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Go look up an older black Hollywood actor on Wikipedia and just read the first sentence, right? <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. No, no, no. Nipsey Russell is an actor, comedian, dancer, Broadway stick, right? Like they list off like 20 things before they can even get to the most popular shit that he was in, right? Because he's Nipsey fucking Russell. But, but you go to like, who's the chick who played Batgirl last year? It'll just say actress, maybe model. You know what I mean? Like that's it. That's all they have to be. They only have, because because some of them, some of them will get it handed to them because they have to check the item off the list, unfortunately. And that's really, to me, that's where you see it in action. Well, unless they're fucking British, which that's that's a whole other rant for me. <laughs> that is true. What is yeah. it? it? It's hilarious because like, White people in America, white actors in America are getting it from both sides. If they're, if they're, if they're, if they're redhead, they're probably going to be recast as a, a black chick. But if they're <laughs> just a white male, they're probably going to be recast by a British guy who's doing an American accent. And it's not always a good American accent. I don't care no, what people fucking no, say. You can it's tell. not. <laughs> no. And you can tell, you know, that there's a great, now I have a book recommendation for you. There's a book called The Season. Um, which uh, is was written, what, William Goldman, I think is the author's name, written, uh, it's about the 1969 uh, theater season. And he has a section where he's like, I'm tired of these rotten British actors coming over and doing these rotten British plays. And the funny thing to me is that for the longest time, it was like happening to white actors. But now we have, I mean, we got, we have a British guy playing Martin Luther King. Are you fucking yep. kidding me? And <laughs> and then you would read, you know, you read these articles about, the, you know, the quote unquote black actor boom or whatever. And it's a bunch of British people. And they, they you know, and I got pissed off because you would see directors like Ava DuVernay, for instance, who would say like, yeah. they're, they're just so good. And da, 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 da. I'm like, OK, I came out of NYU's graduate acting program, the same program that Mahershala Ali, Sterling K. Brown, Denai Gurira came out of. And you have these programs like Juilliard, which, you know, gave us what people like Ving Rhames, for instance. Um, you know, they, 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 they pretend, or Viola Davis is not a Juilliard trained actor. They pretend as if these, um, or Yale, uh, you know, Angela Bassett, um, uh, uh, Charles Dutton, um, gosh, who else, who else? Um, Courtney Vance. These guys all came out of these elite institutions, which have been around for decades and decades, turning out actors who are really highly trained and really versatile. And they and yet you have these American directors who, who sit there and say like, oh, you know, these actors, they have this technical training. Da, da, da. I'm like, 
we're here. We've been here, but you're pretending now. And I, I did right. this. So I did this. Uh, this is a, a side note. I did what, uh, you know, I, I've wanted, always wanted to do. And I did it sort of, I, I called it a reverse Elba, which is where I go and I went to an <laughs> audition. So they were looking for like a new you're series. Like, I broke. What's up? <laughs> you know, so, so, so they were looking for a, a new series regular on, uh, on NCIS. I think it was L Los Angeles or something. And they wanted like a black, a black British guy. And so I, I walked into the casting office. It was like a screening audition or whatever. And uh, the, the, you know, they walk in like, hi, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. Uh, how's your day going? You know, it's like the small talk or whatever. And then we, and then we get into the scene and I launch into a, a, a letter perfect accent. And then I, and then I finish the scene. Right. And then I, and they, they sort of stopped. <laughs> and you're just like, Thank you very much. <laughs> and I was like, yes, that's right, bitch. You just, you just got reverse elbowed. You know? But they, but they just, they, they just presume that like, oh, this person, you know, he's, he's, he sounds like this. Hey, I mean, Americans have such an, a, such an inferiority complex. I think everyone who's British is like smart. And, it's like, true. And it's true. I used you know? to talk about this when I first started out, there was a guy who's also a ranty video game ish review or whatever, but he has an English accent. Mm. And I would always get compared to him in terms of vocabulary and what, you know what I mean? Just because my accent is American, and it, it would crack me the fuck up because we're basically saying the same thing and the same vocabulary. We're, we're very, very similar in terms of our style, but, but he would be the smart one because he's got the English accent. It's my favorite thing in the world. But one yeah. place where you can't fake it, you can give, you, you can have the diversity hires in shows and the critics will shout down I really think one of the front lines in all of this and one of the re reasons the House of Cards started to fall and we started to have this sort of backlash that we're seeing now mm. is because of stand-up comedy. Because you can't, in front of a live audience, you can sweeten it in editing, man. But if you're not funny, you're just not funny. And that's just how it is. I've done stand-up comedy, dude. You will, Oof. If you die a death, a bomb is a bomb. And yeah. you, dude, go watch an Amy Schumer fucking recording <laughs> that's just off of a camera phone. You'd see more belly laughs at a suicide bombing. That's just not how it works. <laughs> at a certain point, you have to have a basic metric and laughter is the metric for stand-up. It just is. Yeah, no, com comedy that that's you're braver than I am. I, I have so much respect for stand up comedians that that is a rough, rough game. I, swear. I did open mic twice. That's oh the God. that's the worst. That's the worst. Man. I think that I think the crowd was good and drunk by the time I showed up, though. I did. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, so, so then, <laughs> then, then I have a, a, a question for you, because all the things that we're talking about, you know, I mean, and I try to, I, I, I feel like now talking about quote unquote wokeness is so cliche now it's kind of played out. But at the same time, these people, they unironically and proudly uh, refer to themselves in, in the same way. But uh, yeah. this is, I'll, I'll be able to work in another one of your, uh, your areas of interest into this. I mean, have you seen, have you observed this at all in, in metal culture? Oh, a bit. I mean, what's really happening now is I think metal's starting to get into two things are kind of cohabitating at certain record companies. Hmm. We've got the sort of turd wave feminist revolution that's been working its way through a lot of Hollywood and move. You, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about? The bat girls and the super girls and so forth. And heavy metals latched onto this. Plus, they've caught onto the fact that, hey, wait a minute, if there's a hot chick fronting the band, mm. <laughs> dudes are going to buy tickets. Dudes are going to buy these albums. So they're like, this is a win win for us. So there are literally, I am persuaded, I am thoroughly persuaded without a sight unseen that these record companies are literally just approaching underwear models. And they're just like, hey, look, we can fix it in post. Okay, like mm. we're gonna form an all girl band or we're gonna put you with a band that know what the fuck they're doing and we'll fix your voice in auto tune. And you're literally seeing this. I see it a lot at like Frontiers Records and stuff, which they, they have a lot of classic metal bands there and so forth. Like I think Striper are on Frontiers and some other bands. And uh, you'll every other week they've got a new group out of Greece or South America. It's just some underwear model chick no one's ever heard of, and she can barely sing, but they fix it in post. <laughs> so they got like, and now they got all girl groups that they're putting together. And I think that's really where that's coming uh, to the fore. But other than that, most of the wokeness is self imposed top down. It's why it's completely inorganic from the media really around metal mm. it's a lot of the um it's like metal sucks and so forth which honestly to even call them immediate it's a fucking blog um metal injection and some of the woker but brave worlds words and bloody knuckles some of these 
uh, reporters that have been around a while, I guess, around metal, they have their ideological framing because they're all coastal cunt flaps. They're all over in the left coast and the right. They're over in New York and LA, just like all the media are everywhere else. So of course they're imposing their worldview uh, on that. So every time you hear about, uh, you may have heard there was a heavy metal musician who was involved in January 6th. He was actually there. Uh, really? the, the lead band leader of a very big band, uh, Iced Earth, uh, John Schaefer. And he was there with the Promise Keepers, I believe, or, or the, the Oath Keepers, sorry, Promise Keepers. That's the Christian organization. <laughs> the Oath Keepers, different, <laughs> different guys. Uh, and uh, he got arrested and he had to turn informant in order to get out of prison because he was there without trial and everything else. So um, ever since then, it's been chum in the water for these shy comms. They've been going crazy on it, right? Everybody with a fuck, one of those floppy beanie hats on and the man buns uh, who work at these organizations, oh they're, uh, they're all over it. So that's really what it, I don't think the musicians are any more woke at all. I actually think in terms of heavy metal, it's considerably less woke if well, that, on a on a band to band member to member basis. But the media just as bad as everywhere else. Well, it's so weird. Bad. Yeah, because I mean, it, it, from what little I know of of metal music, it just it doesn't strike me as a as a medium wherein uh, those kinds of ideas would really, uh, really take hold and, and proliferate. Yeah. No, it doesn't. And that's why the, the, these media organizations I'm mentioning metal, metal sucks, metal injection and so forth. They're like their own comment sections are just nothing but an unremitting succession of shitting on them. Just that's the <laughs> entire thing. It's, just, it's like, if I, you look under every article, most of these websites don't even have comment sections anymore because they get shit mm. on so badly by their own audience. So it's, you can definitely see the divide between the elites. We're telling you what you're allowed to like. They're basically trying to behave like um, pitchfork.com do with mainstream and indie music and so forth. They're trying to behave like that. They're trying to be that for heavy metal and it's just not working out for them. Well, but because well, you look at the actual musicians. Yeah, there's some leftists for sure. I know Tommy Lee is from Motley Crue is pretty leftist. I know uh, D. Snyder from Twisted Sister is pretty left. But then you have Blackie Lawless, who's like just this side of let's go 1776. And other uh, other people, Alice Cooper is much more conservative and so right. forth. Right, I've heard about Alice Cooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, so I have it, to correct you really quickly. Um, what's that? I, I don't call, I don't refer to them, these people as elites. I call them garbage people. So please continue. <laughs> yeah whatever it ain't easy being green so yeah I, I agree it's it's definitely ridiculous though it's like they're trying to maintain this facade uh that they basically are directing public opinion and they're not they're not it's kind of like i mean first off the music industry in general is decimated and look that way hollywood for therein lies your future by the way um, your distribution model is done and uh, you're going to be headed in that direction very, very shortly. Um, but it's so first off, there's no such thing as pop music and nowhere is this more illustrative than in heavy metal. The, you mm. juxtaposed Coachella is the big festival, right? Mm. Coachella lasts a week, sells as many tickets for their week long event as Wacken, the international metal festival in bumfuck Germany sells tickets to their festival which only lasts three days and that's just the paid tickets they have a bunch of people tailgating they have fields of people tailgating so it's uh, hundreds of thousands of more people and you see the footage and you can clearly see there are more people at bucket than there are at coachella because there's no such thing as pop music anymore because the music industry doesn't exist anymore you know what i mean nobody gets to get told what they like anymore so consequently it's just getting more and more ridiculous that these media organizations are telling people oh this is what's popular now and this is what you're allowed to believe and these are your politics and we're assigning these to you no i'm assigning you my middle finger fuck off yeah you know and it's so funny to hear you say all this because um i mean i i recently spoke to um i don't know if you know who uh, mr medicur aka the internet aristocrat uh, yeah of course is. and uh, we were talking about we were going back and talking about we were reminiscing about the uh, of gamergate and this idea of ideological infiltration into these communities um i Which mean it's funny i was i was the pre gamergate a lot of people that's don't, right yeah. that's right you were on top of that like years before that all that i all did the I downfall that. of video game journalism series like two years before gamergate right right because i knew it was going to be a shitstorm. i knew eventually it was going to come to a head i had no idea 
it would be one ugly chick with a big nose that wound up being the catalyst for all of that. But uh, apparently, like, that's all it takes. Yeah, look, it's <laughs> it's the pebble that touches off an avalanche. But yeah, you were saying, sorry. Well, no, well, she also had big titties. But uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, you know, it's just We call the- them mommy milkers now. It's 2022. Get with the program. Come on. Oh, no, they, they titties for me, bro. Sorry, I'm a black man. They got to be titties. <laughs> tig old bitties. Get them tig old bitties in my face. Mm. <laughs> Uh, anyway, <laughs> you know, we, we, this is going on Rumble, not YouTube. Um, but no, it's, you know, it's, but this, but this idea of, uh, and it goes back to the um, the whole uh, communist thing too. I, I mean, it's, it's so funny to see guys like John Wayne, who uh, said, you know, there's this great interview. He's like, you know, the the, the radical left liberals are taking over Hollywood. But it, they, they they these people they they hollow out whatever uh, whatever culture they happen to to find themselves in. And there's this also this this um, this thread I'm, I'm or this uh, this thread that I'm seeing through all of this, which is you have this sort of media culture, these quote unquote garbage people, uh, which, you know, you, which you call elites. I don't know why, uh, but uh, they. They're, they're try, who, self-appointed who, elites. Let's, let's right. contextualize that. But they, but they try to, they, they try to engineer public opinion, but they, but they're sort of also removed from the sort of nuts and bolts of the community and the people that actually, um, yeah. that actually matter, which is the audience. It goes back into this idea of what I was saying before, which is like, you have these people who are creating, it, it's the the the, the uh, gated institutional narrative and the, the disc and yada, 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 where they, they're, they're creating, they're trying to create culture. They think that they're tastemakers, but the audience is saying like, yep. no, nah, I'm not, I'm not really feeling that. And uh, it's, it's just yep. so, I, I, it's, I don't know what it is that the, the, the commonality among all these people that you just, in, in, in different arenas where you see, um, is it, I don't know if it's just like a psychological thing or if it's, if it's just leftism in general and how, and how it, um, and how it becomes a cancer into whatever it touches. It's just, it's so, it's the revisionism that gets me. Like you can mm. dismiss the new shit. Lots of people think, oh, new movies suck on account of they do a lot of them, but uh, you know, it's almost easier to persuade people that new shit is bad than it is that the old, you know what I mean? Like they're going back and like trying to revise things that are hundreds of years old or d- even just decades they're going back and i mean look there's even fairly banal expressions of this like when fairly recently when netflix removed trump's scene from home alone 2 you know what it's i mean so like stupid, they're ju- yeah. <laughs> they're literally pulling a stalin with the missing people in the photograph <laughs> shit that's actually yeah. what's happening and You have to laugh because it's like they're getting to like Gilded Age literature, like bridling at politically incorrect verbiage in 19th century fiction. Like what the fucking Huck Finn is jetaying down Jim Crow country with Shaquille (laughs) O'Neal. What the fuck do you think is going to break out here? An acapella rendition of We Are the World? Like this is it's the fucking Gilded Age. Shit, I think we can handle a few end bombs in a in, in a fucking novel that's set in 1876. You know what no, I mean? We can't. And this is one of the reasons that I began to speak up because just just what you said about uh, you said in one of your videos about like comic books or the video game industry, this sort of uh, this ideological infiltration is going to hollow everything out. I, I began. I was noticing what was going on in video games and comics, and I was like. Well, I'm on the inside and reading these scripts, you know, I'm, I was very fortunate to just, you know, I auditioned a lot, which means you have to read a lot of scripts. And I'm just like, <sighs> I'm just, I'm seeing the same thing happening and I'm worried that it's going to lead to the same kind of hollowing out. And now, of course, what we're seeing, especially in the wake of um, the uh, <clears throat> pandemic, um, that right. there's this, <laughs> we, 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 let's, let's not go there. But the uh, honk pandemic? <laughs> uh, honk, honk. Um, <laughs> You know, but I mean, it's it's great to see the sort of decentralization of of um, of our entertainment, but but it's just like people just don't they they don't want to see this stuff. But the people that are inside the the industry itself are sort of completely insulated from this from public opinion. And so and it's so funny now to being on the outside and watching it, and you know they think that they're the most important thing in the world. And yet, you know, I'm in Georgia right now. Uh, I was in New York for 15 years. And it's not until you leave this like this deep blue cocoon that you you realize, wait a minute, normal people, um, they think men are men and women are women. That's going to get me banned. I'm sorry. 
um, oh. you know, they, you know, I'm, you know, you, you work, you go to like a, a, a middle class or working class sort of environment and people are mixing all the time. You know, they, they may, they may tell some racist jokes here and there. Um, but generally people get along and there's, there's far more diversity among these people than there are, you know, amongst these sort of affluent, um, you know, quote unquote, progressive, uh, progressive elites. And it's just so funny to see them, you know, think that they hold the torch for, for you know, for pushing America forward to progress. I'm like, dude, I think, I think we're fine. And going back to what you well, just said. Well, to say about nothing of the fact that like their idea of progress is an ideology that's hundreds of years old. Like, oh yes, let's go back to the year 1770 they, or, but or they don't even know. earlier, 1600s, fucking French revolution. Exactly. Let's but they don't, they don't know. They have no idea that that's the thing. And that's the blind spot I was talking about earlier. They have no idea. They, they'll, they'll, they'll say Nazi, 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 Nazi all day. But they have no idea, like they, they, they they have this blind spot about Stalin, about Mao, Pol Pot, Pinochet, all these people, they have no fucking clue. They have, a, they have a blind spot about Hitler. They have no idea. He gave all kinds of interviews over the 30s talking about how he was, national socialism is, is suffused with the energy of the bourgeoisie, but paired with the intellectuality of Marx. Like these are, these are mm. quotes from Hitler, okay? In interviews, this is, this is a guy whose 21 point economic plan or 25 point economic plan rather included things like the expropriation of public land for common public purpose. Where have I fucking heard that before? The nationalization of all trusts. Where have I fucking heard that before? You know, what is, <laughs> these, are, these are socialist policies. He had commissars that were overseeing uh, air quotes, capitalist industries, which how does that make them capitalist? If there's a commissar overseeing it, making sure that the prices are controlled and so forth and, and that the economy is being directed, how does the, like, how is that capitalism? There are people still unironically to this day who claim Nazi Germany was capitalist. No, it's it was socialist. It was authoritarian national socialist, almost like they were appropriately named or something. But it's <laughs> I agree. It's it's this crazy idea where they're constantly trying to drag us back to 1823 and calling it progress. Well, what's also funny about that is that, uh, you know, for all their belly aching about cultural appropriation, um, they have no qualms about taking uh, taking Karl, Mar Karl Marx as their god, even though I'm like, yeah. you know, so th they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, all of our ideas are being stolen by these white Europeans, yet they worship the ideas of a bunch of white Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> and they, but they but they, they don't make you, the connection. How can you believe in a, a divine bearded man? I worship Karl <laughs> Marx. What are you talking? <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, uh, this is—I mean, this is great. We we, I, we 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 could have talked more and more about uh, communism in Hollywood. I try to keep these things uh, at least to to an hour, but uh, we we I just I enjoy listening to you so much uh, that uh, it, it's it it just felt like a, a crime to 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 interrupt and try to. Uh, uh, steer things, but uh, before we before we go, let's go back and talk about you. You say that you're not uh, an author. You say that you're a writer, but you do have a new you do, you do have a new book coming. In the out. sense that I have written things, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do have a new book. It's called. Uh, it's uh, available for pre order. It's so I'm trying. I'm really not trying to bring novels back. I'm not interested in phone book fantasy. I'm not interested in 500 and 600 plus page count pieces of shit. All the things that are being adapted, ironically, by woke Hollywood and bad streaming services by Amazon. But um, I'm bringing Pulp back, the old school Robert E. Howard, Fritz Leiber, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, that genre of fiction where it's low page count, high action, high plot, high energy, uh, punchy dialogue, that kind of thing. Doesn't waste your time, short chapters and always moving the story forward. That's what I'm, those are, that's what created fantasy fiction. Before Tolkien, there was Robert E. Howard. And you read a Conan story and it's short chapters and heads being chopped off and chicks with big titties. And that's what, that's what sword and sorcery is at the end of the day. And so I'm bringing that back, basically. It's a series, it's called Night Vale. And the latest book is called Death Mask. You can get the first mm. book of uh, The Long Moonlight, which was, a surprise success. I didn't expect anywhere near the level of success it achieved. It's fully illustrated, by the way. Pulps are that way. So it's something between a comic book and a book. So it's fully illustrated. This one has twice as many illustrations as the first one. It's that old school pulp crosshatchy kind of look, a pen and ink oh, cool. sort of look. So it's if you like that kind of detailed art and uh, 
and you like your fantasy with sort of a noir atmosphere, then definitely and, and nice uh, sort of punchy Raymond Chandler-esque dialogue, you'll definitely dig it. Uh, this one's much more in the sword and sorcery vein. So it should be fun. It's available on nightvalenovels.com, by the way, I should say. Awesome, awesome. And then where else can people find you? I know you're on Twitter. You have your YouTube channel. Go ahead and plug it. I am, of course, on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash C slash The Rageaholic. And on Twitter, it is twitter.com slash Razorfist with a zero. Don't ask me why somebody had already taken the Razorfist name and refuses to give it up, even though they haven't tweeted in 12 titty fucking years. (laughs) Well, I'm sorry that you're going through this, but... uh... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, hope... I'm a persecuted minority is what I am. <laughs> well, an intelligent human being, that, that's what it is. <laughs> right. Definitely severe, severe minority. Right. These assholes think reverse cowgirls, the name of a dyslexic superhero. Well, goddamn. Right. Well, uh, you know what? I'll, 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 uh, I will do something unusual for this podcast. And I would like for you to take us out uh, with, with your signature uh, uh, tagline, if you, if you don't mind. My yes. name is Clifton Duncan, and my guest is... I'm Razorfist, God fucking speed! <laughs>